Shri Dhamadar Janani by Shivaram Swami Yani Yani Hagitani Tadbala Charitani Cha Dhadi Nirmantane Kale Smarantitani Agayata While churning, she remembered the childish activities of Krishna, and in her own way she composed songs and enjoyed singing to herself about all those activities. Srimad Bhagavatam 10.9.2 Chapter 1 Setting the Scene It was Diwali Day, the third day of the ancient Vaishnava festival of the same name, the pageants and celebrations of which would resound through the lanes and homes of Gokul for another two blissful days. Festivities had first begun with the Brajbasis cleansing and renovating their homes to receive Goddess Lakshmi, decorating the doorways with colorful designs and gracing window sills with dancing ghee lamps. But on this, the third night of the festival and the actual Diwali day, there would be special celebrations in Nanda Maharaja's kingdom, for it was on this night long ago that Lord Ramachandra returned to Ayodhya with Sita Devi. It was a special day. The sun had yet to rise, and all was still. Gradually, as the light of dawn edged over the horizon, birds awakened, ruffled their feathers, and began singing songs in praise of the king of planets. Those songs were more delightful than the celestial mantra with which brahmanas were greeting the sun. Om Purva Swaha When the cows lowed in concert to the pleasing sounds of birdsong and mantras, then the Rajvasis stirred. Mother Yashoda lay in bed with her son. Waking, she looked towards her child, his lotus eyes closed in sleep, and affectionately whispered, My blue lotus. Then, with the image of her darling still in mine, she cautiously turned to the other side and sighed, Blue lotus, drowsed away. Some very qualified demigods and their equally qualified wives hovered in the sky. They marveled to see the controller of numberless universes in his original gopa form, resting in the arms of his mother. They thrilled as their affection for Krishna surged at the sight of the Lord's mother, who, to the vision of mortals, appeared to be just another gopi. In an attempt to rouse Yashoda Devi and so begin a new baby Krishna's pastimes, a fresh dawn breeze ascended from the cowherd village below. With a rustling of leaves, it weaved in stealth up to the hill, through the now open palace gates, past the many opulent rooms, and onto the first floor balcony of Yashoda's suites, pausing in respect before entering her dawn lit chambers. Mother Yashoda's suites were spacious. The marble tiled bedchamber opened onto an expansive balcony that overlooked the flower garden. Gokul village beyond that, and the pastures of Mahavan beyond that still. Inside the bedchamber was an oversized bed, a burrow, and chair. Two curved divans circling a round table and Krishna's golden cradle. The walls were made of marble inlaid with precious and semi-precious jewels and traditional motifs, which, when touched by lamplight, would act as lamps themselves. Before a mirrored retaining wall between the two gold frame doorways to the balcony was an ornate, full-height 
ghee lamp of one hundred and eight wicks that would illuminate the room at night through a gilded doorway to the west was a spacious dressing salon replete with wardrobes of silken clothes and drawers of priceless ornaments beyond the dressing salon was the bath chamber to the south of which sharing the same balcony was the kitchen and pantry and west of that a stately reception room both the kitchen and reception rooms led down a half flight of stairs to the grand hall of eighty four pillars chaturashti's tomb another separate exit led from the kitchen to the inner courtyard below and to the adjoining gardens that lay through a small guarded gate in the palace walls from the garden one could follow a path through gokul village to the yamuna and it was along this path that madhya shoda would walk for her river bath sometimes with her baby gently touching yashoda's sleeping form the breeze whispered o queen whose good fortune is without limit can you rest in the arms of the goddess of sleep while the cause of creation stirs by your side arise hearing this appeal her bodily hairs erect in ecstasy little by little the beautiful wife of nanda maharaj awoke seeing that her child was still deep in slumber she carefully raised herself then as if drawn by a magnet bent over to gently kiss her son's cheek although he did not stir in his sleep krishna felt the indescribable touch of love personified and that touch caused waves of ecstasy to course through his body and mind bringing pictures of his mother into his dreams he sighed happily puckered his cheeks and then sank deeply into his pillow like a stately swan yashoda rose from bed and tiptoed to her bath chamber where only one of her maids in waiting was present still drowsy she cast a questioning glance at the young girl then remembering that the palace servants were preparing for diwali she nodded her head knowingly it would be a gorgeous festival after bowing to the queen the maid servant skilfully seated her on a dais exchanged her nightgown for a bathing dress and proceeded to remove her pure cosmetics and scented kajal thereafter she wiped yashoda's hair with a soft wet cloth loosening her long braid and carefully combed it so that her hair rested flat on her back while washing yashoda's feet the young gopi said everyone is so excited about making this diwali festival special yashoda replied in a whisper why do they want it to be so special because your son krishna is not old enough to relish such events everyone wants to please him that's kind of them because of the love they bear for krishna service streams spontaneously from their hearts yashoda accepted the mouthwash offered to her and began to brush her teeth with a eucalyptus twig while the girl mixed herbs and scents into the bath water after rinsing her mouth and discarding its contents into a spittoon yashoda devi closed her eyes as the maid servant massaged her limbs with aromatic oils washed her hair and then bathed her and dried her during all this they spoke sundari go and see if my son is still sleeping peeking into the bedchamber she replied even at such a young age he resembles a resting god that is what the sage garga concluded that he would be good as narayan yashoda devi nodded her head because 
My transcendental son is exactly like Narayan in qualities, opulence, fame, and influence. Gargamuni told us to raise him very carefully. Oh, I am so excited. Just hearing these things might make my hair stand on end. Since my son has appeared in our town, there seems to be some special magic that makes every one's heart thrill with joy, even at the most trying times. Yes, replied the maid. It is as if we have been transported to Vaikuntha or beyond. And through these unceasing waves of happiness, your son and his sport seem to flourish in our minds in such a way that we can think of nothing else. Is that bad? the queen teased, her voice rich with pride. Not at all. It is delightful, except that... Except what? Except that when we are lost to thoughts of his pranks, we are prone to be late for our duties, or worse, we tend to spoil them, like burning meals. Gently slapping the girl's cheek, Yashoda smiled. Oh, you exaggerate. You're making excuses for burning my son's milk. Hurry and dress me. With Yashoda's bath completed, the maid servant brought forth a petticoat, a saffron yellow sari, and a matching choli. She then brought a large tray of ornaments laden with jeweled rings, anklets, bracelets, and necklaces of gold. Following the Diwali tradition, the clothes and ornaments were new. Nanda Maharaj personally saw to it. And when the servant girl, distracted by her own Krishna Leela chatter, proved too slow, Mother Yashoda dressed herself. Mildly rebuking her assistant, Yashoda said, My son will wake at any moment, and here you are taking hours to ornament me. I will do it myself. Meanwhile, quickly decorate my head and braid with these flowers. Taking a seat behind Nanda's queen, with a basket of mullet tea flowers in her lap, the maidservant carefully inserted one flower after the other in Yashoda's braid until it looked like a spotted serpent. She then tied a small garland to both the root and the tip of the braid, and after decorating the back, she moved to one side and then the other, placing flowers in and above the curls hanging over Yashoda's forehead. When touching Yashoda's hair, loving thoughts would stream through the maidservant's body like electric currents. She reasoned, The vines of Mother Yashoda's thoughts have become bluish by constant meditation on Krishna. Sprinkled by the nectar of love, they have grown out as her hair. Inspecting her artistry, she added, Goddesses fall from their airplanes in envy to see the beauty of this queen. Restless for the service of her son, Yashoda cut short her own grooming, and followed by her assistant, hurried into the courtyard below, where three golden churns of milk were waiting. Like the village women, the men had also left early that morning, but they had gone to perform the annual sacrifice for the heavenly king, Indra, before returning for Diwali. Therefore Yashoda would tote these churns upstairs herself. From half the milk she would make yogurt for tomorrow's butter, and from the other half she would prepare sweets by boiling and condensing. Nanamaraj was the master of 900,000 cows. Of these, five or seven were as rare as a horse with a black ear because of the superlative quality of their milk, creamy, tasty, and aromatic. Padma Gandhi was one such cow, famed throughout Raj because her milk shared the aroma of the red lotus. To make their special milk even more special, these cows were carefully pastured in a divine meadow whose grasses were soft, juicy, and fragrant. Some gopas suggested 
that the seeds of this field originated from heaven. The milk of these cows was then delivered daily in three golden urns to Mother Yashoda, whose servants converted some into yogurt and boiled the rest for sweets. While it was natural that a queen supply her son with the best of everything, there was another reason Yashoda gave this special milk to Krishna. She wanted to wean him off stealing. Somehow my son has become addicted to stealing the milk produced from our neighbors. To break this habit, I must entice him by providing butter that is far superior to that which he can get elsewhere. And so Yashoda not only collected the best milk for Krishna, but often churned it and boiled it herself. This would be the case today. Yashoda would churn the yogurt and would also watch the stove. These girls cannot be trusted. They regularly burn the milk, she thought. And with reliable Rohini taking Balaram to Brother Upananda's village, I'll have to do things myself. Tightening her garments, Yashoda poured the milk into a large pot on the stove. And from the yogurt that was prepared the previous day, she spooned the best part into a churn near the door of the bedchamber. From there she would be able to see Krishna on the bed as well as the boiling milk on the stove, while the maidservant deftly ignited the sandalwood fire. Yashoda began to churn the yogurt, and as she did, she gradually sank into the quicksand of Krishna Leela. Her service complete, the maidservant eagerly left Yashoda and Krishna for the Diwali preparations. As a queen who was regularly accompanied by her retinue, Yashoda was pleased to now be alone with her son for a change. She whispered, If one is decorated with a celestial blue lotus, no other ornament is needed. Looking out the window, Yashoda could see at a distance a procession of gopas accompanied by gopis and children seated in bullock carts. It was Nanda Maharaj accompanying Rohini and Balaram to Upananda's home in Sahara. Today the king would not attend the Indra Puja. His younger brother Sunanda would supervise those ceremonies. Once the brothers had completed their functions, they and their retinues would return for the Diwali celebrations. Squinting into the sunshine, Yashoda Devi could make out her husband at the head of the procession, his golden chariot resplendent like a second sun. Her heart swelled with affection for her righteous spouse, who had bestowed upon her the inconceivable treasure of Krishna. Folding in her hands in respect, she whispered, Namo Stute Gopalara, O best of cowherd men, I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. Then she thought, By the grace of my husband, our household has become famous for sheltering Gopala, and I in return have become famous as Yashoda, the one who gives fame. But there was more to it than that. The truth of the matter is that by her love for her son, Madhya Yashoda is so great that she gives fame to Krishna, to her noble husband, and to their family lineage. She is truly the better half of Nanda Maharaj, and that distinction adds to his super-excellent paternal love for the Lord and makes him the best of all gopas. Thus, while it is sometimes said that Nanda is fortunate as Yashoda, and she is as fortunate as he, learned sages agree that because of her unrivaled love, Mother Yashoda is the more blessed of the two. This truth is further confirmed by the pastime about to unfold, the Damodar Lila, a pastime in which she alone shares center stage with Krishna. <laughs> 